Hi, I'm Billy Goodnick, host of Garden Wise, the place where all the cool kids come to learn about sustainable landscaping. I'm at Terrasol Garden Center, just off Patterson and the 101 Freeway, and I'm here to talk with Mike Tully, the owner of Terrasol. We're gonna talk about container gardens and how there's a place for container gardens in just about any garden, whether you're using a little balcony or you're gardening in a full-scale garden. Watch what we have to say. So Mike, I'm always impressed with the selection of pots that you have here. How does somebody go about figuring out which uh, containers to purchase for their own garden? Okay, good question, Billy. Um, tip number one, certainly um, we're looking at aesthetics. You know, whatever's gonna appeal to you is uh, maybe your driving choice, but looking at the physicality of why you may choose one pot versus another. Um, like a plastic pot, for example, really nice decorative containers. Um, they can be beneficial in several ways. Uh, they're lighter weight, easier to move around the garden, less expensive. Um, as far as aspects of plant performance, they tend to retain moisture longer, which can be beneficial for plants that have a tendency to dry out more quickly. So it's gonna ease up on your watering schedule a little bit. Um, so that's a real benefit of them is they do retain more moisture. Um, if it's a very hot area, you may wanna consider not using plastic because plastic will retain more heat and potentially harm your roots by heating up too much on hot days. So the great benefits of plastic is moisture retention, lightweight, easy to use. Another choice for containers is your good old classic terracotta. Um, terracotta has just a timeless look, um, very long lasting, holds up well. Um, benefits of terracotta is it does dry out more quickly, which certain plants are definitely gonna appreciate specifically looking at succulents um, or plants that are in more shady zones, the terracotta is gonna dry out more quickly and therefore create a happier plant for you. Um, what's in between those? We're looking at a glazed pot. So this kind of has a little bit of both benefits here. The glazed is gonna help retain a little bit more moisture as the plastic does, um, but you're getting a much nicer look, um, a lot more beautiful colors in there and it still does dry out a little more quickly than the plastic. So you're kind of falling right in between the plastic containers and the terracotta. So glazed are a really nice choice also, and your, um, the design ability with how many different cool pots there are glazed just explodes your world. So we've got different types of uh, bags of potting soil I saw on my way in and products that call themselves compost and mulch, etc. What do we need to put in the pot? Yes, so potted plants, first of all, make sure you're getting a product that is geared for container use. In most nurseries, you're gonna find quite a bit of soil amendments also, different subject, but make sure you're not getting a soil amendment. So let's make sure you're getting a uh, potting soil. So you have your basic potting soil, which is gonna be good for, you know, most of your annual and perennial flowers, trees, shrubs, whatever you may wanna put in a container. Regular potting soil, a little bit richer, a um, little bit more moisture retentive uh, for your plants that I've just mentioned. Thinking of succulents or plants that may want a faster drying out period, you can also go with a cactus mix. Cactus mix generally has a more coarse texture to it. There's more pumice or perlite in there and it's gonna create a faster draining soil and a soil that dries out more quickly. That's kind of your two basics as far as potting soil. If you use a good quality potting soil, appropriate for the type of plants you're using, you're in good shape. Um, people definitely have a tendency to customize their soil. We can always help you do that if you have questions regarding a more complex succulent or a uh, challenging planting situation. So there's definitely more than one way to success with soils and you may talk to several different um, experienced growers and they may all give you a different recipe. That doesn't mean one recipe is right or wrong. That takes some intuition and we're happy to help um, guide you if you wanna start creating some custom soils for particular planting reasons. So a lot of people know that in order for a plant to grow in a really healthy way, we need to make sure that there's some air in the soil that they drain. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Another good question. Tip number three, talking about um, the mechanics of potting 
uh, and the drainage aspects. So um, as far as stopping soil from washing out the bottom of your pot, um, using something like you can purchase the keeper stoppers here, which is basically like a nice little screen that you just place over your drainage hole on the inside of the pot. Um, you can also use coffee filters for this purpose. You can use old recycled screen from your garage, um, whatever you might find appropriate. Not only does this help keep the soil in your pot, it actually stops uh, slugs from getting up into your drain hole. Often they like to get up in there and, and live in there and actually lay eggs in your soil sometimes. So it can help reduce um, pest issues also by not letting them get into the bottom of your pot. Um, there's kind of an old school thought of putting gravel or pottery shards in the bottom of your pot to improve your drainage. Um, not necessarily a wrong thing to do, but in my experience, I've never seen it necessary and I actually don't follow that rule myself. Um, if I'm using a good quality potting soil and paying attention to watering cycles, I actually find without the pottery shards or gravel in the bottom, my plants perform better. So my preference is to not use that. Some people may have great success with it, but I don't find it necessary. Okay, everybody's big question is watering. How often should I water? How much should I water? Give us some more. Okay. Uh, good question. Everybody wants that knowledge and very difficult to give specifics like that regarding um, watering schedule on containers or even landscape plants in your garden. Um, I will say number one thing is really being mentally engaged and paying attention to all the factors involved. That being our shifts in weather in Santa Barbara. We can go from a month of fog to 80 degree windy weeks. Um, so really paying attention to all the different factors. Where is your pot? How much sun or shade is it in? What type of weather is happening? What, type, what time of year is it? Are we winter or summer? How large is your container? All of these things play a role in how often you need to water. Um, what I like to tell people is think of a watering, a checking schedule, not a watering schedule. Very difficult to tell somebody how often to water exactly. Um, the best way for you to approach that as a home gardener is to be paying attention to all those factors and using your fingers and your eyes. So when you water, you should water thoroughly so water drains out the bottom of the pot. So you're watering thoroughly with each watering. You're not gonna water again until the plant is ready. When might that be? Uh, smaller pot, check more often. You might be checking every two to three days. Larger pot, maybe you're checking once a week. But use your fingers and your eyes and if you feel moisture in the soil, you don't need to be watering. Check a couple days later, notice the progression of drying. A deeper pot obviously may dry out here in the top couple inches, but still be wet down low. Be aware of that. Where shallow pot, yes, if it's dry up here, it's probably dry a couple more inches low. So you're gonna need to water those more frequently. Um, so again, it really takes intuition and nobody's gonna give you that exact answer you want. So the more effort you put into it and think about all those factors, the better off you're gonna be. Um, a thing about watering that people often encounter after freshly planting is first few times they're watering, they're noticing a kind of a dark liquid coming out the bottom of the pot. Um, basically that's the richness of your soil kind of um, being washed out, some of the tannins in the wood product. Um, it's not a negative, it's a natural process of the soil kind of leaching some of the product out. Um, this may occur for the first few waterings. If your pots are on a surface that you're concerned about, a nice deck or patio, um, think about coming back an hour or two after you've watered to wash those areas down. That's usually just gonna occur in the few, first few waterings, but definitely something uh, I get asked about quite a bit. Another tool that can help you as far as determining watering schedule, I still feel that you need your brain involved with this unit here, but the moisture meter can get a reading farther down into deeper pots than you may be able to get with your fingers. So this can be a very helpful tool in addition to you paying attention to all those factors and keeping your mind mentally engaged in all the other factors you need to be paying attention to. Uh, we see a lot of stuff on TV and in ads and commercials about this plant food or that plant food grow bigger, better, stronger flowers. Um, myth or is there more we need to know? Well, tip number five we're talking about here, uh, feeding or fertilizing your plants. Again, there's not one specific way to achieve success with this. Um, but basically you want to look at follow directions of the package you're using. Different products are gonna have different application rates depending on their purpose. So um, as far as how often should you feed, not more often than whatever product you're using tells you to. 
Now, why would you choose one product versus another? Um, probably looking at the cycle of your planting. Are you planting a seasonal winter bowl that's just gonna have your winter pansies and you're gonna repot it in two or three months? If that's the case, you wanna think about using liquids. Um, liquids you can use more frequently and they're gonna give a more gentle, even frequent feed to keep those short-lived containers boosting up to their highest performance. Um, if you're planting longer term perennials, maybe trees or shrubs in containers, they don't need that same type of quick frequent boost. It's a longer haul for them in the container and using more of a time release type fertilizer or a general organic dry fertilizer is fine. Um, so again, just really kind of think about what life expectancy your pot has for you as far as that planting. And again, the shorter that cycle is gonna be with your annual type flowers, the more frequently you wanna feed. Overfeeding or applying more than what the product says, I have never found to be beneficial. Okay, there's all kinds of beautiful plants here and uh, some of them look really nice together. Can we just put whatever we want in a pot or are there some rules to follow? Good question on tip number six here. We're talking about what you'd say plant compatibility. Now, in general, if you're planting a container for any sort of um, expected life in your garden to enjoy these flowers or foliage you're planting, certainly you should be aware of what you're putting together and plants should be compatible. Uh, meaning you may not be combining a moisture loving fern with a desert cactus. Um, that's a pretty basic example there. So be aware of what plant material you're using. Are these sun loving plants? Are they shade loving plants? Make sure you're combining the right groups of plants. Um, I will make a mention that uh, social media and magazine print, other things have created a wonderful um, inspiration for people to really get jazzed about container planting like I haven't seen in the past, it does bring some misleading images where I see um, certain succulents or plants planted together in indoor situations where it may not really be uh, realistic long term. So, you know, if you need to put something together for a photo shoot or a wedding or something that's very quick, go for it and do whatever you want together. But if you want this um, planting to last and give you some lasting beauty really make a point of choosing plants that are compatible. Certainly we can help you direct you to those right groups. Okay we know that plants grow, they get bigger, they need some root space. Could you talk a little bit more about how to pick the right size pot for the project you're putting together? So often I see people having maybe limited space areas and wanting to use a little four or six inch clay pot to put a handful of um, nice flowering annuals in there and maybe that's the person who comes back two weeks later showing me their pot just suffering and maybe not having the ability to hold on to enough water. So what I like to say is try not to skimp on your containers. Um, number one, be aware of what plants you're putting in there and the ultimate size of them, um, you know, because that's going to give you a relation of how much root system you may need to support that growth. Um, and in general, the more soil you have for plant root system, the longer that plant is gonna live in a container. If you try and cram something in a little six inch pot, you're not gonna get a long performance from that container because you're limiting the root growth. Not too much root is gonna uh, promote not a whole lot of plant growth. So again, really think about going with the biggest container you can um, in order to give yourself the longest performance out of that container. Let's talk about reasons to uh, put container plants in your garden. And in this case, I'm just talking about outdoor plants, not house plants. Uh, it might be that you're a renter and you just don't want to invest and start putting plants in the ground. It could be that you're just stuck for space. You just have a small patio or balcony uh, or a townhouse sort of situation. And all you need, all you really have room for is a few small plants. Maybe you have a problem soil. It's just really tough to grow the plants that you want and you might be more satisfied putting plants in containers so that you don't have to hassle with uh, the gophers, the clay soil, some of the other problems we have around here. Another reason to put together some flower pots would be for seasonal change. Sometimes you go to the supermarket, you come home with uh, an orchid or an arrangement, but it's nice to have something a little more permanent and long lasting uh, out on your patio table, at your front door. Uh, maybe it'll be a seasonal change for the holidays or something that celebrates spring. So you show up at Terrasol Nursery and there are hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands of plants here to choose from. And if you're like me, you're a kid uh, in a candy store, you wanna take everything home. 
So put the brakes on a little bit and a few thoughts you might have are what style of planter do I want to put together? Sometimes you have a container or you shop for a container first and you find plants that go with that container. Here's an example of one from my backyard. I came to Terrasol last year and I just fell in love with this pot. Not really my style usually. I go toward more kind of contemporary or classic type stuff, but I just love these colors. Brought the pot home, uh, lived with it for a few weeks and came back to the nursery and found this wonderful combination. And what I'm doing here is picking up some of these colors, obviously, in the flowers. These are a couple of uh, types of pansies, and this is a honey-colored one that goes nicely with the yellow. White always works with everything. It amplifies all the other colors. And then to pick up the blue, and it's a little early in the season, but we've got these dark purple salvia flowers in here. So sometimes the container drives the plant selection. And sometimes you just fall in love with the plants and you um, find a pot that's going to support it. Uh, there's always the neutral of going with a classic style terracotta pot or maybe a white or monochromatic pot, uh, but you can also have fun with color. Another thing to consider as you're going is just the colors that you like. And uh, if you want a little inspiration, I sometimes remind my clients, if you're in the house and you're looking out at your patio and that's where the pot's going to be, maybe you can harmonize the colors in the interior of the house with the exterior. Um, for example, if you have kind of a, a cool color scheme, you might want to go with cooler colored flowers, or if you have a warmer color scheme, try on some of these. Uh, warm colors are yellows, oranges, uh, burgundy, red, those sorts of things, or you can mix it all up. Um, and again, we're going to learn a little more about how to combine different types of plants, how much space to give them, but in terms of inspiration for your color scheme, this might get you started. Another way to go, and you don't have to sacrifice a nice looking arrangement just because you want also to have something to eat. I've got a few really stunning um, potted vegetable plant arrangements, uh, and this will show you some of the, the capability of it. These are a couple types of lettuce. We've got the dark leaf lettuce, and this one that's called flashy trout romaine lettuce. So um, it's got this really nice sort of dappled pattern to it. But there's other even showier vegetables. We've got uh, this uh, ornamental kale, a couple of types here. Uh, these look really nice around Christmas time out on the front porch. These are winter. Um, preferable crops. Also, uh, there's a lot of herbs that have very nice decorative value that you can combine. Um, we're looking at chives here with their nice grassy leaves, and we've got the great kind of variegated golden form of sage, culinary sage, asparagus, which you'd need a really big tub for, but you can grow this successfully in a container. Um, and plants like rosemary, which double as shrubs in the garden, as well as a clipped plant um, in a good size container. And the more you keep clipping this, the denser it gets. So you can create some really nice arrangements. If you've been watching the show for a while and uh, hear me talking about design, I always talk about harmony and contrast and how that's the cornerstone, those are the cornerstones for putting any design together, any visual design. So by harmony, we mean plants that have some similarities between them, and contrast obviously means the differences between plants. What I like about these three is um, there's the harmonious aspect of pink flowers with pink flowers, and uh, there's also the harmonious um, effect of the sort of darker leaves here with these more bronzy colored leaves. The contrast comes from things like the flower sizes being different. We've got a very fine textured flower here, more of kind of a um, rounded flower here. We've got the fine, uh, almost needle-like foliage of this breath of heaven and the uh, knotweed. So there's harmony and contrast right here. When we bring that in, we get even more complexity because of the structural difference of this plant, the darker foliage color, uh, and it puts together a very nice three-plant combination. So look for thrillers, fillers, and spillers that would all be compatible in the same pot. Some plants just do it all on their own. This beautiful cylindrical uh, shaped succulent is a plant that just has its own sculptural value. And imagine this backlit against a wall at night. It would just be stunning. Um, a plant like this might be best off just in a pot by itself 
or if you've got enough space for it and you want to try some complementary uh, combinations, you might find a plant with a harmonious color but a completely different shape. These Echeveria um, would all suit that. Another plant combination that I love, this eventually gets really large. This is a, um, a pencil plant or a pencil tree and it has these uh, beautiful kind of sunburned colored leaves to it. What if we combine it for contrast with a similar color foliage but a completely different shaped plant? So these could be in two separate pots near each other or they could go in one larger pot. Um, you see a lot of ready to go, in fact they have them here at, uh, at uh, Terrasol, combinations of similar types of plants. So you get a, a nice little combination of same plant form from these Echeveria, um, but also get some up close kind of jewel box type of combinations by combining the different styles. So that's it for container plants for now. I hope it inspires you to uh, put together some nice container plantings in your own garden. Um, come down to Terrasol, they've got some great advice and as you can see an amazing array of plants and pots. So join us again. This is just a small sampling of some of the beautiful containers that you can find at Terrasol Garden Center and I want to thank Mike for all that great information. Next up we have a recurring segment where I talk to local landscape designers. This time it's Chris Gilliland, landscape architect, and we're going to look at a garden he recently completed for a family. It went from kind of a ho-hum, undeveloped landscape to a beautiful paradise. And I hope you'll understand why it might be a good idea to hire a professional designer and bring them in on your project. So here we are with another interview of a landscape designer. I'm with Chris Gilliland. Um, aside from being a really great landscape architect, he also used up all the L's in my Scrabble set. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. I knew about Chris from talking with other colleagues, great reputation. Little did I know I lived around the corner from a project that's been impressing me for the, the last year. I live near the Fairview Shopping Center and to me it's like uh, going into a botanic garden, beautiful plant choices, great plant composition, and now I get to talk to the guy behind it all. So this is Chris Gilliland and I got some questions for him. We're going to learn more about what landscape architects do, why you might want to use one in your own garden. So Chris, I'm always interested in people's origin stories. How did the door open that got you into landscape architecture? When I was a kid I had a lot of chores and um, that's putting it short and blunt. Um, so the one thing that I kind of enjoyed doing was working out in the yard. And so when I was a uh, a junior in, in high school, my parents made me choose a major, and so I was wanting to do something outside, right? And I figured marine biology or something to that effect, and ended up um, finding landscape architecture. I'd never even heard of it before. And I went to a little, uh, actually, university in uh, Indiana, five years, and then I came out to Santa Barbara right after that and worked for someone for about four years and got my landscape architect license as soon as I could. So I think I was 23, maybe 24, and then started my own business when I was 26. And that was 20 something years ago, I think. Yeah, and uh, I love it because it's so many different professions in one. You know, I mean, it's architecture, it's landscaping, it's engineering, it's biology, it's just, the, the list is endless and it's I just love it as a profession it's amazing so on a typical project um, how does it start how do people find you do you uh, go out and advertise you have somebody walking around with a, a sandwich sign <laughs> how, do, how do people get in touch with uh, with Chris Gilliland yeah so uh, for residential for me it's mostly word of mouth um, it's friends of clients former clients, you know, uh, clients that come back and want to do other projects. There's a lot of turnover in Santa Barbara. Um, so I've had multiple people that I've done multiple gardens for. Um, and as far as deciding whether or not I want to do it, it's, um, oh, you know, it's a lot to do with the client. I mean, you have to kind of get along. Um, and there's a certain energy there. Um, if you're clashing at the first meeting, and it's probably not, not gonna be the right fit. And I'll often, or if I'm just too busy, I will recommend others, um, other colleagues and, and peers of mine to, uh, to these clients. And so that works well, and that's kind of how I got started too, was uh, folks recommended me when they were too busy. And so the, the beginning 
you know, uh, for six or seven years, I was struggling <laughs> just to find enough work because it's such a word of mouth kind of town. Um, but, you know, I mean, the re referrals come from all over the place, general contractors, developers, uh, like I said, other clients, uh, architects, gardeners, um, all over the place. Chris, walk me through a typical project. You've got the job, um, you're ready to start the design. What does somebody have to look forward to in terms of getting to completion and popping the cork on a bottle of champagne? Well, for me, it's, it's, I typically break it down into three phases, right? So the first design phase is, um, you know, conceptual preliminary, doing a kind of a color, nice, fancy, nice looking plan. Um, and of course, meeting with uh, the client before that, then the first meeting is crucial. Um, getting to know what they want. I mean, what elements do you want to include? Is there a jacuzzi? Is there a bocce court? Is there a swimming pool, fire pit? What, what kind of elements uh, are you wanting to incorporate into your yard? Um, so a nice color plan after that. Uh, the second phase for me is kind of a design, de design development. So construction documents, um, doing very specific um, detailed plans so that it can be built uh, properly and it can be bid, uh, bid and then built. And third for me is the construction administration aspect. So actually, I, I'm sort of a design build kind of uh, approach. So what does that mean, design build? Design build typically would mean that one company would um, design and then construct. And I used to have a crew, actually. I would have had my landscape contractor's license also. Oh. But uh, for me, what it means these days is I design it <clears throat> and then I stay involved until the very end. So, um, you know, I want to make sure that everything is installed per plan and also be flexible during the process when things come up to make changes. So if you were hoping to put a tree right there, but there's a huge boulder, you know, where do we move it to so that it's still you still have the impact of it and you're not compromising another uh, part of the design. I'm always intrigued uh, in my practice and, and also how other people do it on how you take that wish list that a client needs that's very specific to their family and how they live, how they want to use their outdoor spaces and how do you get all that to fit onto a site. So Chris, um, the, the wish list after the interview and you came up with the uses that they have for all these outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. How do you pick what's going to go where? Uh, where are we right now? What's the function of this space? And last thing, I'm loading you up here, is how do you figure out what plants to put around it? Yeah, that is a loaded question. Um, well, uh, you know, a lot of figuring out what goes where has a lot to do with the house, right? So if um, you want to come out into a space that you know, close to the living space indoors, maybe that's where you want your fire pit or your gathering space. You don't want to have to walk to the other side of the property uh, to get to those spaces. So a uh, good rule of thumb is actually, um, you know, the further away it is, the less you're going to use it right. in terms of like, say, a swimming pool or a spa or a fire pit or something to that effect. Yeah. So yeah, if you had um, to take a cable car up to your spa, you're yeah, not going to use it Probably not going to use it as much. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, then as far as the plants go a lot of times clients you know will uh, say I love this plant I don't like that plant um, not as much anymore people are so busy um, so they just want you know we talk about themes a lot you know, I love succulents or I want it to be subtropical right so we're right now we're kind of in the little subtropical zone in this garden and uh, it's kind of you know where I usually would use that where it's a little shady maybe um, and surprisingly enough um, everybody thinks tropical meaning a ton of water, right? But there are plants that look, you know, subtropical that are drought tolerant. And so I like to use things like that, like the philodendron xanadu or the lomandras or, um, you know, bamboo, for instance. Um, you know, it's even some of the ferns, very drought tolerant. Ah, bamboo. Uh, it's not as evil as everyone makes it out yeah, to be are, if you pick the right one. That's right. There are two types of bamboo. There's the running bamboo, which is the one that everyone hates right. because it will take over your yard and your neighbor's yard. And then the clumping bamboos, which swell, but they don't run and yeah. spread and grow. They don't in surprise places. you by coming up in the bedroom. Exactly. Or, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. Any other favorites in here? Things uh, people might be unfamiliar with? Oh, let's see. There's uh, Begonia Freddy over here. There's some Azalea. Um, you know, this is an acacia tree, actually, that'll get, you know, 20 
uh, 25 feet. These were actually here, um, the trachycarpus um, windmill palms. No, yeah? Yeah, windmill, windmill palms. Palm. Yeah. Um, we don't want to show off with too many botanical names. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, I don't want to. Uh, some mondo grass over there. Um, you know, cordyline, soledad, purple. So a lot of plants that I use often in a subtropical setting. Yeah. Well, which but helps like because to, if you're familiar with it and you've seen it succeed on other jobs, right. you can't invent a yeah, you lotus know land expect. palette for every job. Sure. Right. But you also want to, you know, I experiment a lot too. And I uh, see plants growing in various uh, areas and you want to try them out yourself because you know they do well, then yeah, it's nice to try different uh, compositions and, and uh, use different plants in different ways. Cool. Yeah. Uh, you want to walk me off to another area? Let's sure. see what else is Let's going on. So this is dining and... Yeah, just, just kind of outdoor, outdoor gathering, dining. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, and then, you know, it, this is actually... We're in Goleta, and this is sort of a cul-de-sac lot, and so it's actually much bigger than it looks from the outside. And uh, right here, the original design, we had a bocce court. Right, so we actually scrapped that, and I'm kind of glad we did because it we created a really nice space here. It's wonderful, yeah. just flows. Yeah. Okay, let's take a walk. Okay, very good. I'm impressed by this bed. You've got, what, six or seven feet to get from front to back. Yeah, about that. You've got these wonderful textures going on in here with layering. Tell me what you were thinking when you came up with this plant combination. Well, this, just what you said, layering, right? So um, starting low, going medium, and up tall, and that's pretty much as simple as I can put it. Uh, but, you know, we throw things off a little bit so it's not just straight lines, right. unless you're really going for a formal look. But uh, this was more, again, we're in the subtropical garden here, so we want it to be a little more wild and a little more natural looking. And uh, so yeah, mondo grass, ferns, begonias, fatsia, cordyline, this kentia palm over here, which is magnificent. Uh, but, but, um, but yeah, different, colors and textures and forms yeah. uh, to achieve that. Well, what I like about this is, aside from the begonias, there's so much contrast in everything going on here. It just shows you don't always have to rely on flowers right. to create year-round interest. Okay, I'm fascinated, but you've got all this other stuff going on here. I feel like I'm in Disneyland, and we go from uh, the, the uh, jungle boat ride out into the lion country and that sort of thing, so show me around. So when I first visited this garden with you uh, a few weeks ago when we were scouting it, I was really taken by this bed. It's just, uh, it, it just works so well, plus it's this point that separates one part of the garden from the other mm -hmm. space. So tell me a little about this, how it came about, how you dealt with an existing tree in here, your plant selection. Well, that's, uh, that was the big thing, was the big tree. This magnolia obviously has been here for a while, and uh, rather than keeping this level through here, we raised it up just a little bit so that we didn't have to impact the roots mm. of that tree so much, right? And the roots are very shallow on the magnolias, so this was basically in response to the tree. So you're planting in what would, what unless you have x-ray vision, you know there's gonna be some big roots in here. Mm -hmm. Did that influence the plant selection in here? Not especially, but I mean, it, actually now that I think about it, it, this sort of light grass is um, not gonna to compete too much with the existing uh, roots from the magnolia, but the other thing about this bed is that uh, it's it's much more simplistic, right? The the bed that we spoke about previously, the subtropical, the mix, the, right. the sort of wild and natural. You know, you want um, a variety if it calls for it, and the reason for that is you, if it's everything is busy and complicated, then it's busy and and, and complicated. And complicated. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you want the eye to rest sometimes too. And uh, so this is an example of sort of a transitional space where um, it's not too complex and it's simple and you can just sort of breeze over it with your eye and, you know, and it, and it works. So walk me through, this is the conceptual phase, mm -hmm. um, certainly no, nowhere near the detail that we had um, looking at the finished garden here. So just tell me about the, the kind of major areas that are working in here. Yeah, so um, up to this point, you and I, we've looked at this. This was the subtropical zones that we were looking at. Right. This is that large magnolia tree. So these are things we're working around mm -hmm. and with. Obviously, the house is here. Uh, driveway entry is here. Um, you know, and then this whole shale zone through here, this is kind of our 
So we have our you know, transition zones, and then we have sort of our circulation, of course, is very important, how you meander through the site, how you get through the site, and where you're going, right? So we have another little seating area out here that was created. We have the fire pit, um, we, and then you know, a little orchard is happening over here. Mm -hmm. But we, I put a, an olive tree here, which is, uh, this is sort of utility zone. So we want to kind of screen that off a little bit, right? right? We don't want to have to look back into the trash area. Mm -hmm. um, and this out here? Uh, raised beds, vegetable beds. Oh boy. Yeah. They're going to open a stall at Farmer's Market? That's right. I think that's the rumor. So the yeah. other thing that caught my eye when we came over here is, uh, I call them the Superman shields. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to have one with me. You called it the guitar pick. Yeah. How did you... Uh, Come about this this shape here. It's really pleasing. It's, it's been called many things: lily pads, guitar picks. Um, nobody knows what to make of it, but it's it's sort of a design language that I've been developing for the last few years, and I don't really know where it came from. But to me, it's somewhere halfway between formal and informal, mm -hmm. rectilinear and curvilinear, um, and fresh and new and sort of modern. So um, I'm kind of not using that on not maybe not all my projects, but uh, it's. It came from somewhere and it continues to rear its beautiful head. Well, I promise not to steal it. Okay. So, so far we've been looking at the sort of social kickback spaces. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to walk through the rest of the yard and learn a little bit more about it. Where, where are we here? Duh. The fire pit. So you call this the fire pit area? Yeah. Because of the... The fire the pit. fire pit, okay. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> and a really fun planting going on behind here. How, how did you marry these two? Yeah, so the succulent garden sort of behind us. Um, maybe a couple reasons for that. The client really wanted some succulents, and I love succulents, as most people do. So uh, the other reason being this big blank wall here. So we wanted things that were going to read up against that yeah. and, and also get tall. You know, we have some euphorbias that are going to get up to the roof eventually here. This is a very new garden, but uh, some aloes, aloe, aloe, some Hello. portulacaria, <laughs> um, and then, you know, a little uh, peppermint tree over there and some other little things that haven't quite grown in yet. But And, um, and once again, <laughs> we have your guitar pick lily there's pad. There's that shape again. Superman shield. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, let's head that way. I want to see uh, all the edible stuff. All right. So we're standing on a dreaded evil lawn. All lawns bad? No. No. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there's kids in this family, there's yeah. dogs, and you need somewhere to play. So um, I limit the use of lawn as much as possible. We don't want it. It's, we're not in England in the 19th century, so we don't need huge rolling hills of lawn. Uh, we have a, a nice lawn here, just big enough to kick a soccer ball around or throw a ball back and forth or a frisbee, but it doesn't carpet the whole property. We have other um, ground materials for that, like this, sh this beautiful, you know, brown shale mm -hmm. uh, and that uses up space without using up water. Right. And I find as long as you're, you do the best you can to make the lawn as sustainable as possible, the proper irrigation, the proper scheduling, right. not over fertilizing, those yep. sort of things. Proper soil preparation right. Right. Uh, before the lawn even goes down. No yeah. one's going to the afterlife uh, because they have a little bit of lawn. And they, right. They, yeah. So proper uh, irrigation. But, but we're surrounded by what look like some great munchies and edibles. Mm. Tell me what's going on here. This client wanted to have make some food, so we came up with the idea of these raised beds, which flow along the, the, the lines that we were discussing earlier, uh, just sort of fit into the design. We have a little hedge down in front, which will get larger. This is a very young garden, mm -hmm. but uh, the idea was to have that hedge grow up so that these are hidden, because raised beds don't always look good. Right. Right, so uh, when they're not and looking the as good, at the end of tomato season, they look even worse. Right, exactly. Like a Tim Burton movie sort of thing. <laughs> yep. So, and then the, the stone wall behind to help, you know, just create more space. And so we've got neighbors that have a higher elevation property than here. So you had to, yep. to so break it in between. It's a beautifully done wall. Yeah. It's a very and nice stone uh, anything else good to eat back in here? Oh, let's see. We do have a little orchard over here. Um, uh, again, also very young, but uh, I believe that's a nectarine. We have, you know, the, the typical lemons and limes. It looks like and passion fruit on the... Passion vine on the fence. So yeah. you can just munch your way right through there. Yeah. And then on the back slope. The back slope? Kind of inaccessible, so what was the treatment on that? Yeah, they kind of went back to the native 
scene a little bit there. And it mirrors what you've got in the front yard. In the front yard, right. And it's on a hillside, so those natives help hold that slope better than, say, a real shallow-rooted um, exotic plant of some Great. sort. Well, this is a fabulous garden. Thank you for taking time to show me through it Thank and you. share it with everybody. And yeah, uh, very enjoyable. Um, it's in my neighborhood, so I'll have to peek over the fence. Yeah. Plus, I know the owner. That's right. So I'll, yeah. I'll keep track of this. Excellent. Thanks a bunch. Pleasure, Billy. Thank you. Yeah. My thanks to Chris Gilliland, landscape architect, and I hope you understand why it might be a good idea to bring a professional in on your project. We're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned. Now that summer is here, it's the perfect time to spruce up your sprinklers. Step 1. While your system is running, check for broken sprinklers, broken drip tubing, or runoff. Step 2. Replace and upgrade old parts. Step 3. Adjust your sprinkler timer. Use the online landscape watering calculator to help you determine the best schedule for your garden. A well-maintained irrigation system will go a long way towards saving you water and money. For more information, visit waterwisesb.org. Water wisely. It's simple. Visit waterwisesb.org. Let's save together. Hi, welcome back. Let's talk about irrigation. Old school. Put a nozzle on a hose, water your garden. Most people these days are watering their gardens with drip irrigation systems, but it doesn't just stop on the day that you install the drip. As the plants get bigger, they need water out where the roots are going to grow. So our water wizard, Kathy Pere, is gonna explain how to do that to benefit your garden and save water. Hi, I'm Kathy Pere, and I'm with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation. Today we're gonna to talk about how to expand your irrigation system with the plants as they grow. We're gonna quick do a site evaluation on this new landscape. It's about a year and a half old. The irrigation is exactly how it was when the plants were babies, so there's going to be some opportunities to move those emitters out to the drip lines. Walk with me, let's go take a tour. In doing our site evaluation, one of the first things that I noticed was that these lavenders, they looked like they were awesome. Although the homeowner was saying he's had to replace one of them, and then when we look at this one, it's really kind of dying at the base. What that tells me is that potentially the water is being fed to this plant. The emitter is too close to the roots and the root itself is potentially getting some root rot and affecting the health of this water wise plant. Too much water kills more plants than not enough water. I think that this is contributing to this plant's health. When I come down under this drip tube, you can see that this is where the, the plant growth, where the crown of the plant is, and the emitter is right here. Basically, in the plant as it grew, it grew around the emitter. One of the things we're gonna do today is we're gonna add a spaghetti tubing to that existing emitter. It's a one gallon per hour, it's just the right size, but this plant could really use a watering on either side away from the roots under what's known as the drip line. So as the water comes down, you want to provide water out here and you want to provide water out here. It allows the roots to expand out through the soil so that when you water that nice, deep, infrequent, the roots will grow into the moisture and the plant will be just that much healthier and drought resistant. Let's flag this area. We have a couple of choices to make here. We can either expand the irrigation for this plant, or we might actually want to look at replacing this lavender. It looks like it's really been suffering with the way that the water's been applied. We are right next to this beautiful plant. It's a wistringia, and you can kind of pet it and smell it. It's super sweet. But what we're actually here to look at is where is this emitter? This emitter is really close. Look at the size of this plant. It's doing great, but its emitter is right there at the crown of the plant. We're gonna actually attach what's a spaghetti tube and then 
expand the emitters to go on one side under what's known as the drip line, just inside, and then with the spaghetti tube, we're gonna extend it to the other side. So this plant's literally gonna have a one gallon per hour emitter over here and a one gallon per hour emitter on this side. So it has an even puddle of water under the soil. So doing a little bit of this um, expanding of your drip system to meet your plant's growth, it can be done by a homeowner. All you need are some basic, basic tools. I keep mine in just a little fishing tackle box. And what I have in here are just some basic things that you probably will need. I have connectors, I have tees, I have extra emitters because they do pop off or they get knocked off. I have a figure eight. This is used for closing the end of your tube. Don't use duct tape. It is not a tool to use in the garden. And the most important, goof plugs. These are how you fill in a hole where you don't have a plant because you don't want to just water dirt unless you really like weeding. The other things you'll need, very basic, is something to make a hole in the tube. I have a couple of these different ones. I like the handles, this one and this one. Both do the same thing. They make a hole for the emitter. And I use a little set of pliers when I'm holding on to say a goof plug. It's a little easier to push it into the tube. You can do it with your fingers, um, but I just like to keep a little set of pliers handy. What we're gonna work on right now, and I wanna show you the different parts, we're gonna actually use this one emitter that's gonna provide the water, and I'm gonna put this together and talk to you as we do it. So we're gonna put a spaghetti tube with this connector, it's called a T. The water comes up and then it's going to go two different directions. So this is a barbed connector. So we'll connect it onto the barb. So now we have water that comes out to these. I cut the spaghetti extensions long so that I could adapt where I wanted to put this on the plant. So I'm going to take one here. This is for the left side of the plant. and we'll connect it on to the barbed fitting. And then I want this one to be watering up right about here. So I'm going to use my pruning shears and cut it off. And then I have an emitter, which also has a barbed connection so that it doesn't come off and we'll put that there for now. When we come back later, we might want to tack this down with a soil staple to hold it in place. So now, let me move this so you can see. I'm going to connect this long portion here for the second emitter to, on my T. And I'm gonna actually take this and wrap it around the other side of the plant. I like to put them on the back of the plant so that you don't really see much of the tubing. There we go. And then put the tubing back. We'll need a little tack for this one probably. But as you can see, we now have an emitter on the outside drip line, just inside the drip line. It's gonna drop one gallon per hour. And then if we go to the other side of the plant, we have, I'll try and show you here, we have an emitter that's offering water on this side. So as the water drips down, it's gonna spread out underground. You're gonna have a little reservoir of water on this side, a little reservoir over here. They connect underground and they give the plant a great moist base to grow into and to be healthy. Thanks for joining us in exploring our growing garden and how to expand our irrigation to meet the plant's needs. For more resources on how to water, how long to water, different choices of plants, visit our website at waterwisesb.org. Thank you, Kathy. Great segment. For more irrigation tips, log on to waterwisesb.org. Have you ever been walking down the street and you just see this stunning plant and you think to yourself, what tree is that? 
Well, that's the name of this segment, and we're gonna be talking about the Western Redbud, a beautiful tree with so many wonderful features, a good size to fit into your garden. It's a California native, and it doesn't use a lot of water. What tree is that? What tree is that? Ah, what tree is that? What tree is that? The Western Redbud, botanically known as Cerasus occidentalis, is a deciduous California native tree commonly found in foothill canyons and on mountain slopes. But it is a beautiful small to medium sized tree that will also look great in most styles of local landscapes. The botanical term deciduous means it seasonally sheds its leaves each winter. It can vary in height from 10 to 15 feet and under ideal conditions sometimes 20 with a similar width of up to 15 feet. Ideal for even smaller gardens or as a focal point in any garden. Left unpruned, it grows as a multi-branch shrub, but can be purchased or trained as a single trunk. The best time to train it is in late fall when the branches are easier to see and before buds set for springtime blooms. Some of this versatile plant's desirable features are its low water usage, its stunning bright magenta flowers that stand out in the garden, and its ability to grow in nearly every soil type as long as the drainage is relatively good. After the spring flowers fade, leaves appear with their delicate heart-shaped form. The western redbud grows moderately fast and tolerates full sun or partial shade. In its natural environment, the redbud can be found in woodland and chaparral areas below 4,500 feet throughout California. In spring, the brilliant flowers attract many sought-after pollinators like native bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. After the flowers are pollinated, they develop into dark brown seed pods that hang from the thin, long branches, adding a contrasting visual texture. Some people don't like the look of the seed pods, but they can be plucked off with ease. Fun fact! On close inspection, you may find what look like circular cutouts along the leaf edges. These are evidence that local leaf cutter bees have been hard at work chewing off bits of foliage to line their nests. As cooler nights approach in autumn, the leaves turn a warm yellow and red before falling to the ground, revealing another winning feature, the delicate branches and twigs that will bring next year's flowers. Fun fact number two, if your aging redbud isn't flowering as much as when it was in its prime, you can prune it hard, even all the way to the ground, in effect, pressing the restart button, and it will spring back to life with a new crop of branches and buds. In addition to the native western redbud, its cousin, the Canadian redbud, is also well adapted to Santa Barbara's climate. Some, like the forest pansy cultivar, feature deep burgundy-colored foliage and the same lovely flowers. There's even a white form. You can find mature specimens of Cerasus occidentalis at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, Alice Keck Park Memorial Garden, La Mesa Park, and along parts of State Street. The best time to see the flowers is in early spring and trailing into summer, but this tree is a winner any time of year. Make sure you tune into every episode of Garden Wise and learn more about Santa Barbara's diverse and beautiful urban forest. Well, that does it for this episode from the Terrasol Garden Center. We hope you've enjoyed and learned something new that you can bring to your garden. And remember, everything you do in your garden can help make this a more beautiful and sustainable community. There's lots more resources online, so visit waterwisesb.org. Well, that does it for me. I'm Billy Goodnick, local landscape architect. And remember, be water wise, Santa Barbara. <laughs>